so that this great bastion of freedom can still exist today. We do honor those men and women throughout the years who have fought and died so that we can sit in the middle of this beautiful little small town and proclaim the name of Jesus Christ without any fear. We just want to take a moment and remember as well. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen. Ms. Olivia, please. Psalm 33, and I know that as 
we explore the scriptures today, I just want you to hear the inspiration of our Lord. Let the godly sing for joy to the Lord. It is fitting for the pure to praise him. Praise the Lord with melodies on the lyre. Make music for him on the ten-stringed ten harp. Sing a new song of praise to him. Play skillfully on the harp and sing with joy for the word of the Lord holds true and we can trust everything he does. He loves whatever is just and good. The unfailing love of the Lord fills the earth. The Lord merely spoke and the heavens were created. He breathed the word and all the stars were born. He assigned the sea its boundaries and locked the oceans in its vast reservoirs. Let the whole world fear the Lord and let everyone stand in awe of him. For when he spoke, the world began. It appeared at his command. The Lord frustrates the plans of the nations and thwarts all of their schemes. But the Lord's plans stand firm forever. His intentions can never be shaken. What joy for the nation whose God is the Lord, whose people he has chosen as its inheritance. The Lord looks down from heaven and sees the whole human race. From his throne he observes all who live on the earth. He made their hearts so he understands everything they do. That's an important verse. <laughs> the best equipped army cannot save a king, nor is, is great strength enough to save a warrior. Don't count on your war horse to give you victory for all its strength it cannot save you. But the Lord watches over those who fear him, those who rely on his unfailing love. He rescues them from death and keeps them alive in times of famine. We put our hope in the Lord. Amen. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. Let your unfailing love surround us, Lord, for our hope is in you alone. Amen. And I wanted to speak that specifically because of Memorial Day and all of the honor that we give to all of the human beings who have made this possible. And it's right that we do that. But ultimately, this nation even will die with humankind. But our souls, if we are submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ, will live forever with him. Would you join me in song this morning? The first is joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Um, and we, I can't wait to hear this on the flute. So please stand as you're able and enjoy the worship this morning.
Yeah, that's a beautiful, beautiful song.
If you want to understand, and if, if we've talked a lot about the law and the reason for the law, you know, beginning with the Ten Commandments and then growing into the, the laws of uh, is, Israelite culture, the Torah, the 600 plus laws that dealt with uh, sociology and, and uh, 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 sexuality and politics and religion and being holy and being clean and all of those different laws. If you are curious about that, Galatians is your book. There's, I mean, Paul just gives a very, very practical, down-to-earth, understandable, but very, very thorough, of course, teaching about the law versus grace. Because what had happened in Galatia was that they understood the grace of God and they submitted themselves, believed in Jesus Christ, and submitted themselves to the Holy Spirit, and then tried to say, yes, we need the Holy Spirit plus. So you see the church in Galatia being a lot like churches. Church, the churches do what churches do. We've got Jesus, right? Because of Jesus, we've got the Holy Spirit of God. And now let's add this to it, that to it, this to it, that to it, and this to it to make it just the way we like it. And then before you know it, all of these burdens that you have placed upon the church, the burdens that you have placed upon churchgoers, the burdens that you have placed upon, upon followers of Jesus Christ, add up. And you're like, this just stinks. I don't like this. There's so much to do and there's so much, you know, and really, a lot of it doesn't have anything to do with following Jesus or being submitted to the teachings of the Holy Spirit. So when we go to Galatia, we see that he's going to spend a awful lot of time saying, we were under the law. We are now not under the law. We are free of the law. And he gives a great account. Go and read it. That's your homework. He gives a great discussion of the purpose of the law and what purpose it served in our life, in the, in the lives of the generations leading up to Jesus Christ and what purpose it serves now as we look back and it teaches us. He says, so that, that now Christ has come and we are free of that. We realize that God loves us because he loves us, because we are his creation and he wants us to be in a relationship with him. And when we believe that Jesus died for our sins, we give ourselves over to that reality and God comes and indwells us and that is pure, absolute freedom. Freedom from religion, freedom from oppression, freedom from sin, freedom from that treadmill that we get on trying to prove ourselves, trying to be good enough, freedom. God says, I know you're not good enough. Listen, I love you anyway. Come unto me. Amen. We'll talk, right? Amen. Come on. So then Paul says, so that's what happened. So don't go back. He says, now that you are a follower of Jesus Christ, now that you've submitted yourself to the will of the Holy Spirit, don't go back and put yourself under a bunch of rules and regulations that aren't necessary anymore. Enjoy your freedom. Yeah. He says, when you become a Christian, and that term wasn't used specifically in Galatians, but we understand what it means. When you become a Christian, when you become a follower of, of the Nazarene, of Jesus Christ, he says, a new kind of spiritual warfare will come upon you. He said, when, when we were under the law, or those who are completely outside of the teachings of God, he says, you know, that, that's a one kind of spiritual warfare. And that is Satan trying to prevent anybody from hearing the word of God, or prevent anybody from hearing the truth of the word of God. So he'll get in and he'll infect false teachers. Satan will do anything he can to prevent people from crossing that threshold, so to speak. But for those who have crossed the threshold, Satan's not done. If we've crossed the threshold and we've created a gathering 
and we've created a church, Satan would love nothing more than to corrupt that church. And if he can do it by insidious little ideas or feelings that he can put into the, the hearts and minds of the people, if he can do it by invading the, the leaders, so to speak, and get some false teaching in there, however he can get that church out of that picture. He says, so there's a whole new concept of spiritual warfare that we have to deal with as Christians. Right? What do we say around here? <clears throat> Satan has no interest in a dead church. Right. He's already got that. He already owns that. If you don't experience spiritual warfare in your church, that's kind of not a good thing. That means that... Sorry, that's why I you need to understand. And so we, we receive that sort of, I've always said, right, as a backhanded compliment when we experience Satan coming against us because Holy Spirit of God is guiding us, leading us, we are submitted to him, and man, does Satan hate God. He, he just wants to pluck that jewel out of his hand. So there we are in Galatians. That can you up to speed. Let's go home and read it yourself. There's, nothing, not, there's no substitute. There's no teacher that can substitute you reading the word. Olivia, I want to go past the John scripture right to Galatians 5. Because remember, we've got to keep this in context. And again, there's a, the fantastic lead up to this is that Paul is saying, I understand what's going to come against you, but you need to understand that Satan doesn't un have a chance because the Holy Spirit of God indwells him. And so he says in chapter 5, beginning with 16, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. Okay? And we can stop there. We can preach on that for the rest of our lives. Yes. That, that one line, that one word, that one concept. And that's what he talks about. He says, these things that you think you need to do, you don't need to do them. And if you are a congregation submitted unto the Holy Spirit of God, then you then just stop adding to it. Receive the word of God. <clears throat> Sing songs that praise and worship God. Pray to God. Anoint one another. Share the Lord's Supper together. Stop doing things and adding to this idea that this is what you've got to do and this is what you've got to give and this is what you've got to wear and these are the things that you've got to say in order to be all right with the church. That's not true. I call it the New Testament treadmill. Right? We, and I always say that. We human beings can't, we just fall all over ourselves to get in the way of God's will. We just can't help it. It's part of our sinful natures. I know God's got this, but watch what I can do. Is what we do all the time. I believe in God. I know. I'm, I'm submitting to you. But stop. <laughs> but stop. <laughs> so he's saying, with regard to church, and with regard to your gatherings, and with, with regard to you as a follower of Jesus Christ, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. I'm going to stop there again because here we are, right? And we're like, whoa, okay, well, we've got this little church on the hill. We could be a big church on the hill and we could do this and we could build a new building and we could go global and we could uh, stop. That's my sinful nature. Holy Spirit of God has willed me here and I've followed his will and I'm submitted to his will. Now, of course, I want to make prudent, wise decisions according to his will. But if I'm like, we can really take this and we can take off and we can be international. Shut up. Shut up, Satan. He just wants to, you know, he wants to corrupt and destroy. Not that that doesn't happen. Right? But if it's my will and not his, boom, that's just... So stop it. 
We're still stuck in that first verse. You think, <laughs> I'll get you out of here, I promise. It's supposed to get cooler as the day goes on. So the longer I preach, the cooler it's going to get. We're going to be okay. So just, no, I'm just kidding. But I just want you to see, for when you take this home and read it and unpack it yourself, remember reading it in the context in which I'm teaching it now. He's really speaking to a congregation that got it right and now is getting it wrong. They got it right. They're like, Holy Spirit of God, but, and he's like, stop it. <laughs> the sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the spirit wants. So we're going to feel this, even though we're submitted. How can we know what truly is evil and bad for us if we don't know what truly is good and right for us? So that's when spiritual warfare really gets ramped up. You're not feeling any spiritual warfare if you're giving in to your sin nature. You love it. There's no warfare. There's no conscience. You're like, bring it on. But now you've given yourself to the Holy Spirit of God, and you're like, oh my. But wait, I still like those things. Yeah, we know you do. And God knows you do. What did we read in that song where I stopped, remember? God made everybody, and he knows what's in your heart. So you say, no, I'm holier than thou. I no longer look at those types of pictures, and I no longer think those kinds of thoughts. Yes, you do. Be honest with yourself and be honest with God, and you will grow through it. But if you deny it and keep it in the dark, it will grow in you. All right. That's a whole other sermon. Where, where, where am I? This is just amazing stuff, right? It's just amazing stuff. You unpack this word. The Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. So here we are, followers of Christ. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you are not free to carry out your good intentions. You... You must submit. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. And what he's saying there, once you read the rest of this, you'll see. You're not under obligation to what Pastor Brian says you should do. You want to be right with God? Here's what you need to do. You need to give 20% to the church. You need to wear these sorts of things to church. You need to, whatever. You're not under obligation, you're under, you, you under obligation to the Holy Spirit of God. You're not under the obligation of the law of Moses. You don't have to do a bunch of things to gain God's approval or anybody else's approval on earth. You're free to worship. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Now, let's be very clear. When we talk about Scripture, these are the kinds of things people don't like to talk about and don't like to preach. Because Scripture, the Holy Spirit, names names. God bless you. Right? He names names. He names sin. And if you don't think God knows you in your deepest, darkest moments, listen to this. Because He does. When we're following your sinful nature, when you're in the dark with your thoughts... The results are very clear, aren't they, ladies and gentlemen? Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling. Am I getting warm? Jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like this. If God didn't take his holy finger and put something right there... Right? And that's why he does it. He says, I know you. I know. I know where you are right now. I know what you're struggling with. And I'm going to name it for you. So you know I know. He's not going to make some big, broad, oh, I know people aren't the best they could be, or I know that you can always be better. No, he says, this is what you will give yourself into if you go into the dark and follow your sinful desires. In fact, if there's something there that you don't go, it doesn't go ouchie. Right? There's sins there that go make me go ouchie. Okay, okay, I get it. Thank you. Because anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. You want the truth? There's the truth. 
You can sugarcoat it any way that you want, but if you're given over to your sinful nature and you're not submitted to the uh, will of the Father by the power of Jesus Christ, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. I hope every church in America today and around the world is preaching that because people need to know that there is right and wrong, that there is good and evil, that there is salvation and there is damnation. That's the way it works. And I know you're working on yourself and all of those things. I don't even mean to be glib about that. But when you work on yourself, work on yourself according to Jesus Christ's vision for who you are as a son or a daughter of God. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit. He goes right into this. This is the part that we like. This is the part where you'll probably pick up most pastors picking up on verse 22. Because let me tell you how awesome you are. I know you came in thinking that you were good. But I want to tell you how awesome you really are, my fellow Christians. How fantastic we are. Did you just read? I, you see what I'm saying? Is clearly delineating a choice that we have in terms of where we, by our own free will, turn our attention. This is not just about how awesome Christians are. It is about how awesome you can be. That much is true. The Holy Spirit, when you turn your attention and submit to the will of God by the power of the Holy Spirit, produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. There is no law that can come against your faithfulness. If there is a law written in a church or in the Word of God that says, no, don't be as faithful as you should be, I can't find it. If it's in your church, get out of that church. Then I know it's not in the Word of God. There is no word in, in the Word of God. This is by the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't be as kind as you possibly can. It's not there. If you're being taught that in the church, get out of that church. Then I know it's not in the Word of God. There is no law against these things, this fruit. And when we talk about the transformative nature of the Holy Spirit, this is what we're talking about. This is how they will know me. They will know me by their fruit. They will know me by their love. Amen. And so we go into this whole thing, sinful nature. Right? Let's be clear. We go into this, given over to sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins. We go into it given over to those things. Because that's what Satan tells us feels good. That's what Satan tells us will get us what we want. That's what Satan will tell us. That's how we get to the top of the mountain. And when we give ourselves over to the reality of the Holy Spirit, you talk about the internal transformational nature of the gospel. This is what it's talking about. Those things turn into love. Notice it's first. God is love. Notice it's not, it's not first by accident. God is love. That's all over scripture. Love. Joy. Peace. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And now Paul says in a couple sentences what I've just said in a half an hour. <laughs> Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous. I just want to read that one more time. I want to leave you with that. Because you're, you know, regardless of where you are coming into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, 
whether you have submitted yourself to the will of the Holy Spirit of God, that's between you and your Creator. That's between you and your Savior. But if Galatians 5 doesn't spell it out for you, over here, give yourself over to your sinful nature. Live this life. And I would go home and turn on any news channel. You will see every one of those sins. Go home and turn on any, any network during prime time and watch the programs that they're putting out. You will see every one of those sins clearly celebrated. Clearly celebrated. Not just brought forth like, oh, look at this. Celebrated in the spotlight and celebrated every one of those sins. You don't think that Satan's doing his work? Here's your choice. Go. Do it. There. Give yourself over to that. And you will die and go to hell. You will not inherit the kingdom of God. Over here, give, nail, the, nail those desires to the cross. Understand what Christ did for you and give yourself over to the will of God. And over here is the transformational result. You will be a different person. But, but I'll still, yes, we know you will still. That's why we have church. And we can talk about it, and we can pray, and we can work through it, and we can grow. And iron will sharpen iron, and we will become better. You'll get through it. You'll be better. You will be. Instead about working on yourself, you will become the person that Jesus Christ knows you can be. Right? Galatians 5, boom. I mean, what more? There it is. I just want to leave you with the, these two verses again. Because those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed their passions, the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there with Jesus. I'm done with that. I accept the salvation that you offer, Christ. I'm sorry. I have gone through every one of those sins and I am sorry. And I know that you died so that you can pay the price for me so that I can actually have this prayer. Thank you. And since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. It's a whole other sermon in there. Every means every part of your life. So there you go. Galatians, I mean, it's just an incredible, powerful teaching. And it talks about the whole aspect of spiritual warfare that comes upon us as the Christian church. As followers of Christ. As individuals and as congregations. And don't let anybody put you under the law. Again, it is fulfilled. And you are free of it. You follow the teachings of the Word of God and the teachings of the Word of God alone. Father God, thank you for your Word. We do love you and we do appreciate you and we thank you so much for bringing this forward today. The choices are clear and we pray for ourselves, for our, the, those who are closest to us and for your lost around the world, Father God, that we can present the choices to them so that each and every human being will be able to make their own decision. Our spiritual eyes are open and we see the sins that are listed. We see them celebrated in our culture today. Celebrated. And we rebuke them. We may now be in the minority demonstrating God's love and patience and kindness and joy. So be it. We will continue on the narrow path. Nothing will shake us. By the power of God, the Holy Spirit of God, nothing will shake us. So show us, Father God, what to do next as individuals, as families, and as the church. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Just take a couple minutes. We're going to come back and pray.